Hi, I'm Mr. Rose, and today we're going to be discussing an introduction to linear momentum. As you can see, we've got nothing but the best here, so for right now, just ignore this stuff here. We're going to focus, and let's begin. Uh, I usually don't read things to you, but here I'm going to read this definition. Linear momentum, by definition, is a time rate of change of the momentum of a particle that has to be equal to the net force acting on a particle, and that has to also be in the same direction. What does that mean? We've talked about before that linear momentum is actually just an extension of Newton's second law. In reality, linear momentum is Newton's second law. So starting with F net equals MA, if I know acceleration by definition is a time rate of change of velocity, so I have mass times my change in velocity per unit time, and then just with some simple rearranging, I have the net force as a change per unit time, here's my derivative function, of a mass times velocity. By definition, that time rate and change of velocity is what we call a time rate change of momentum. Momentum is brought to us by the letter P. You may recall from earlier, from uh, earlier years in physics, that momentum is just a mass times a velocity. Momentum, notice the vector. I have my little vector signs on top. We know momentum is mass times velocity, and as we've already talked about, momentum is uh, we've already talked about another center of mass. We can find the momentum of a system of particles by using that center of mass. In essence, just like Newton's second law, just like any of Newton's laws, we can't change the momentum of a particle unless a force acts on it. So down here I have an example of a baseball bat hitting a baseball, where the force is a function of time. In other words, that collision as the bat comes through and hits the ball, the, uh, either the longer the ball is in contact or as the bat comes in all the way through, that force is changing. It causes a change in momentum. Set change. Continuing with that simple example, the bat is on the ball changing momentum with respect to time. So my force, uh, the force that acts on the ball is a unit of time, or a function of time rather, is my time rate and change in momentum. Again, simple rearranging, I'm left with this change in momentum, is a time-dependent force over a period of time. When I see the dp and dp, dp and dt, I must think, oh, that's an antiderivative. So here I have my antiderivative momentum is my time rate and change of force, or my, uh, rather, the uh, time-dependent force. This change in momentum, by definition, we're changing again, is something that's brought to us by the capital uh, letter J. That is an impulse, yet another vector. An impulse, by definition, is if I have a force acting on something over a uh, period of time, and that could be time dependent. In other words, it's changing with respect to time. Again, by definition, just the change in momentum. What is all of that telling us? That's telling us that my change in momentum is, by definition, uh, an impulse. An impulse can be calculated by figuring out how much momentum something has prior to how much something happens, I, that's the prior, I apologize, ending, uh, finding the difference of the momentum it started with. So if you go back to the baseball, uh, the baseball hitting the bat, the ball has some momentum coming in, bat hits it, ball changes its momentum. I can find that impulse or change in momentum by subtracting those initial and final momentum. As you can see, I've called it a vector quantity. You'd also see this graph. This graph is an impulse. My impulse over a period of time changes. I have a varying force. You could also think about it as that spring force we just spoke about with energy. That force varies, so my momentum during that whole time can vary. If it's in contact for less time or more time, I have a whole bunch of different variables. I have different forces, different velocities, different accelerations. So we have this little impulse curve as a force versus time. We get a impulse curve with a maximum happening right in the middle. This would be our average impulse. Putting everything together in a very long uh, algebraic question, uh, equation, we have an impulse by definition is just a change in momentum. A change in momentum can be defined as either a change in mass or a change in velocity of that object. It also can be calculated as just a force times an average time. Uh, I said an average force rather times the time.
Second to last set change as the set is continuing to fall apart here. I hope you're getting a kick out of all this. Example problem. Uh, in short, we have a race car driving. Race car loses control, hits a wall. The wall is solid, coming in with a velocity of 70 meters per second. And it hits the wall at an angle of 30 degrees, and bang, it bounces off the wall at 10 degrees. Obviously, it loses some velocity. It gives some energy to the uh, transfer, some energy to the wall. So it's leaving at a smaller speed. Uh, I want to know what is the impulse felt on the 80 kilogram driver because, again, this is an extension of Newton's laws, which means the car hits the wall. The driver also feels a force. All of us know that. Hopefully, none of us have been to car accidents. Unfortunately, you probably will be at some point in time. I've been in a few. Um, it is a simple calculation to find the impulse, and then we want to know what are the impact of the driver. What is, I'm sorry, the impact of the collision, the force of the collision. So we're going to use a simple impulse is my initial momentum, and I'm sorry, my final momentum, subtracting my uh, initial momentum. Momentum is mass times velocity, mass times initial velocity, but it can't be that simple because I have these angles. And again, momentum is a vector quantity. So I need to deal with either I, J, K notation, or I'm going to find my total momentum as I have it set up behind us. I'm breaking things down into components. Let me raise that a little bit. There we go. My momentum in the x direction is just mass times my change in velocity in the x direction. Breaking that down into components, I get a momentum in the x direction, or an impulse, I should say, in the x direction, of negative 910 kilograms times meters per second. That negative is important, and I just brought all of my units through of mass and velocity. Do the same thing in the y direction. I have a momentum of negative 3,500 kilograms times meters per second. To find the net uh, impulse, I just uh, use Pythagorean theorem, and I get an impulse of approximately 3,600, or exactly 3,616 kilograms times meters per second. I'm not done yet because momentum is a vector. So I figure out my angle by taking the inverse tan of my y component divided by my x component, and I get 75.4 degrees. But does that actually make sense? Here I have a negative component in the x direction, a negative component in the y direction, and I have a positive angle. You need to remember, physics is supposed to make sense. If I were to graph my two vector functions, my impulse in the x and my impulse in the y direction, you see my net impulse, or the total impulse, is in quadrant one, one two, three, quadrant three, in the negative direction. There are always two angles that give us the same answer. We have the 75.4, and then we have its complement, I believe, which is all the way on the other side. So from my picture, I'm not actually at 75.4. I'm actually at 255.4 degrees from the positive x-axis. Typically in physics, that's how we define our directions, everything from the positive x-axis. I could also come and subtract this out and say this is at negative 105 or 105 degrees from the positive x-axis. Either one of those would be acceptable, but this is going to be our standard form, so you have to be careful about that. Check your answers. Physics is a science that's supposed to make sense. Uh, lastly, uh, finding the force, that's just easy, a plug and chug question. They gave us a time of 14 milliseconds. Make sure you change time into seconds. Uh, it is just impulse divided by our change in time. You get a big force of 2.58 times 10 to the fifth newtons. Thank you. That's all you have. I will take donations as well as likes, comments, or subscriptions. As you can see, we could use a better setup here. Um, by all means, leave some comments. Thanks.